Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension, and on behalf of those folks and their other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Wednesday Night at the Lab, Ken Bradbury. He's with the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. He was born in Richmond, Indiana, and graduated from Richmond Senior High School. And then he went to Ohio Wesleyan University and majored in geology. He got a master's degree at Indiana University in geology. And then he came here to UW-Madison to get his PhD. And he went way, way out there and got a PhD in hydrogeology. <laughs> then he went directly to the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. That was in 1982. He's been there 36 years and since 2015 he has been the director there and in that role he also serves as Wisconsin State Geologist, which is a role that Thomas Chamberlain and Charles Van Hise, I believe, also held. And they became presidents of the university. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, Ken gets to talk with us about groundwater, wetlands, and geology, the invisible links. And while he's saying they're invisible, I think we're starting to see more and more that they're pretty visible, and the question is, what do we get to do about that? So please join me in welcoming Ken back to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you, Ken. Well, thank you, Tom, and thanks, everybody, for, for coming tonight. Um, so this is a, a reprise of a talk that I, I, I put together for the Wisconsin Wetlands Association for their conference a, a, about a year ago. Um, and it's, I, it's the, the point I want to make is that uh, you know, we, we all like wetlands. Wetlands are pretty prolific in Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. Uh, but groundwater, which as a hydrogeologist is my specialty, is pretty important uh, for wetlands. And many people don't understand all the links. And, and the more we we think about wetlands, we really have to understand the groundwater system around them. So this talks a bit about wetlands and a bit about groundwater and, and how they are, how, how, how they, they act together. Um, there's a lot of wetlands in the upper Midwest, a lot of wetlands in the United States. So all this, on this map, um, all, the, all the green areas are wetlands. And um, you can see that in the upper Midwest, we have our, our share of wetlands more than many other places in the country. This hashed area are the, are the the pothole prairies of uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, where there are many, many, many small wetlands. And so we have a lot of wetlands in the upper Midwest. Uh, and these are all connected to groundwater in, in, in one way or another. Why? Why do we have all these wetlands? And I think it's interesting to, to think about why we have them. First of all, where do wetlands occur? They occur in the, the main areas in the United States are glaciated terrain where we, we are now, also, also in coastal terrain like the, the coastal plain here and in Florida and the, in the, the southeast, and then along rivers like the Mississippi or the Wisconsin. So those are places wetlands occur, but it's interesting to me that if you look at the pattern of wetlands in the upper Midwest, kind of draw a line like this, you realize that they really follow our glaciated area. So here's a map of the of the glaciated region of the upper upper Midwest, uh, so th this is the area covered by covered by glaciers during the Pleistocene, and you can see that that's fairly fairly well matches our the extent of, of major wetlands in the upper Midwest. Why is that? Well, for one thing, the, it's a fairly level topo or, or low low relief topography. We don't have a lot of mountain ranges, unfortunately. And it's a fairly young landscape, and, and it's often kind of hummocky and pitted, so there are a lot of places for, for water to collect. And in general, it's, we have a humid climate, and it's not too far to groundwater in most of these places. So all these things work together to give us a lot of wetlands here. I mentioned the ground, that wetlands are dependent on groundwater. So most people look at a wetland, and they, they, they see a surface water feature, and they don't often think of the subsurface. So this is a cross section across a stream with the wetlands along the shore, and we've got some arrows here. And the importance of this is just to think about the impact of groundwater in feeding the wetland. The wetlands are not always, you know, to some extent, they're based on surface water and runoff 
and rainfall, but groundwater is an important component of the wetland water budget. So in this talk, the, some takeaway messages for you is that the groundwater, wetlands, and surface water are often connected and, and we need to think of them as linked environmental systems. Uh, they're linked in terms of water, chemistry, water quality, uh, and, and what we do to one part of the system affects another part. Uh, understanding the geologic setting, where they occur in the landscape, what kind of rocks are around, what, what the history of that landscape is, what the topography is, is helps us identify the wetland and helps us understand why the wetlands are there. And then water systems are transient, it means they change with time. They change with climate, with weather, with short and long-term climate change or climate cycles. They can change due to uh, uh, what we do on the landscape, like, like uh, changing land use or changing groundwater pumping, and I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, if you're interested in reading more about this, this is, a, this is a free publication you can get from the U.S. Geological Survey, a really, really good um, publication about groundwater and surface water. And, and the subtitle here is A Single Resource, and that's what we like to think about in the Midwest, particularly in the, in the human Midwest here. Groundwater and surface water are not separate things. They're really one, they're, they're two parts of a single system. They need to be thought of and managed together. So that's kind of our... Our, our mantra as, as modern hydrogeologists that the groundwater and surface water really represent a single water resource. I know some of you probably know a lot about groundwater, others maybe not so much, and so I'm going to spend a little time uh, bringing everybody up to speed on what is groundwater. Groundwater is the water that fills the cracks, pores, interstices, voids, and fractures in the rocks and soil uh, beneath our feet here. So, so groundwater is, is water in the ground that's filling, filling these voids. And what do the voids look like? Well, and th these are, this is a classic view of, of the different sorts of porosity that you see in geologic materials. Porosity refers to the open space uh, between, the, between the, the sand grains or, or rocks or, or whatever is making up, making up the, the subsurface. So we can see that these, are, these can be what are called primary openings, which are the spaces between, say, sand grains. If you thought of beach sand, you know, that's, there, there are spaces between those grains. Those are the pores. And, and depending on how well sorted it is, whether all the grains are the same size, like here, or a mixture of sizes, you could have either more or less porosity. The audio engineer says your glasses can hit. Oh, I'll, I'll take them off. Thank you. Right there. Um, the other, so so that's that's called primary porosity because that's that's exists from the time the rock was deposited. Secondary openings are things that occur later, uh, like fractures or dissolution or, or, or solution features or caverns in a karst environment or a cave environment where where uh, openings are are come later than the rock was originally deposited. We have both sorts of porosity in Wisconsin. What does that look like in, in the real world? Well, on the upper right you see a, a, mic, a microscope, uh, op, uh, optical microscope picture of, of some uh, sandstone right here from under Madison, some Cambrian sandstone, and you can see the beautiful uh, rounding and sorting and the, the, of, of these sand grains, that's a wonderful aquifer. That's where all of you are getting your water if you're drinking any water in Madison. It's coming out of an aquifer like that. And here's how it looks in the field on the lower left. Cambrian sandstone, you can see some, some cross bedding in there. Typically, the rocks like this have a porosity of about 15%, 10 to 15%, meaning 10 to 15% of that material is, is just open space. That's where the water can be stored and transmitted. Now if we go to other kinds of rocks like limestone or dolomite, which are not really made of grains, but instead of, are, 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 are um, uh, more of a, a um, form, form from layers and layers of tiny sea creatures that have de deposited over the years and then recrystallized, that these, this rock is not very porous naturally, but it has lots of cracks and fractures in it, and the water comes from cracks and fractures. So you can see this would be a, a outcrop that you'd see up in Door County, uh, Wisconsin, or, or other places where we have a lot of, a lot of limestone or, or dolostone, dolomite. I'll talk about the water table and, and the, the, what, what, what the water table is and what the groundwater system looks like. 
So this is a cross-section of a, of a, a typical uh, cartoonish landscape. Well, this is the land surface. And anywhere here in, in Wisconsin, if we go, we dig a hole or we drill a well, sooner or later we're going to hit water. And that water, where that sits, is called the water table. The water table is a surface. And below that surface, all it's, it's called the saturated zone, and all the pores and those cracks are full of water at that point. So that's they're saturated. Above that water table, the pores are not full of water. They're full of air or carbon dioxide or something besides water, uh, probably a mixture of air, carbon dioxide, maybe some other gases sometimes. Often right over the water table, there's a thin zone called the capillary fringe where water gets pulled up into the pores by capillary action, just like you'd have water moving up in a soda straw, but that's a fairly, fairly thin zone, only a, only a few inches thick or less usually. But it's important to remember that the water table is the top of the saturated zone, because you're going to see some other diagrams that have water tables in them. And then it's always important to think about the water cycle. Um, and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, understand this, but, but water flows in a cycle from, from starting its precipitation, rain and snow on the landscape, and then moving in uh, to partitioning itself as it hits the landscape, and much of it runs off the landscape. Um, some of it evaporates, and, and a, a bit of it recharges or percolates down and become, becomes groundwater, and then it becomes part of the groundwater system. And so these uh, rocks and soil down here are what we would call aquifers because they can transmit groundwater along these flow lines that might go to a well, if there's a well there, or they might go a long way to discharge to a lake or a river, a discharge point, or they might discharge to our wetland here. So here, here comes a wetland. And then we have other processes like evapotranspiration that's going to take that water back out and it's going to become part of the cycle again. So remember, it's a closed cycle. So understanding how all these things fit together is, is part of our understanding here. Groundwater moves in three dimensions. Uh, groundwater is not static. It's not just sitting in one spot down there. It's moving. And in a humid climate like Wisconsin, it's usually moving from higher parts of the landscape to lower parts of the landscape. But it's not moving, it, 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 it's not just moving horizontally, it's moving vertically as well. So if we take this cartoon apart, we can see that groundwater is, is um, it's moving laterally, but it's also moving in these, in these curved, curving flow paths that go moving down under the higher parts of the landscape, and then actually moving upward under the lower parts of the landscape to discharge to a surface water feature. This happens to be a a stream, but it could be a, a lake or a wetland as well. And so it's, it's quite uh, common to, to see upward groundwater flow under these low parts of the landscape. And so if any of you have ever seen a spring or a flowing well, an artesian well, you're getting water that's coming up with pressure from somewhere, uh, somewhere deep below the surface, but that pressure is, is related to where, to the altitude at which that water first entered the groundwater flow system. And then the other interesting feature here is that groundwater is moving two different directions from, this, say, the top of this hill. That's called the groundwater divide. And that divides groundwater into uh, flow systems so that on one side of a hill, groundwater is going one way. The other side, it's going the other way, just as you would have a, a topographic divides in the landscape. The only difference here is that we can move this divide by doing things like pumping water or, or, or doing a change in, the, in land use. We can, we can actually move that divide sometimes. Groundwater moves slowly. Um, it generally, in a place like Wisconsin, and we're only talking about inches or a few feet per year. There are exceptions to that. Uh, in, a, in a limestone or dolomite where those fractures are, like I showed you, you could get much rapid, more rapid movement, tens to hundreds to even thousands of feet per day sometimes. But in general, think of tens of feet per year, uh, which is not very fast. Groundwater. Is, is moving fairly slowly, and if we get into something like a clay, we're talking inches or millimeters per year sometimes, very, sometimes very, very slow. I already mentioned groundwater flow systems, but to, to put it in another context, uh, we need to think about the whole system as, as a place that starts with groundwater recharge or where groundwater is entering the landscape and then it's moving to groundwater discharge at a, at a surface water feature or sometimes to a well. And then those flow paths, again, don't just go laterally. They go vertically downward and then back up. 
And de depending on how, on the local geology, they could go very deep and that water could be in the ground for maybe thousands of years, or they can go very shallow and just be in the ground for a few days. And of course, the length of the flow path has an influence on the chemistry of the water and, and, and what, you know, because the water is dissolving things along the way and then the water may also be picking up things that are spilled on the surface or things that are coming down from the soil. So understanding the flow path is also important. And again, I'm telling you all these things because when we get to think about wetlands, all these things become important in understanding wetlands. Um, I mentioned groundwater recharge, and here we, here we can think about wetlands a little bit. Are wetlands places that groundwater is discharging or groundwater is recharging? And so this might be a, a, a typical cross-section of, of a place in Wisconsin. We have clayey moraine. A moraine is a, is a glacial deposit, and often in Wisconsin those are very clayey, and they, they may create a hummocky upland. And because it's clay, we may say, well, there's not much recharge going on there because it's clay. Over here is more of a sandy place, and there's maybe more recharge there. And sometimes people want to protect recharge areas, and so they may say, well, we better protect this recharge area. But it, we, we don't often think of what's going on up, up here on the clay moraine. And in fact, there may be some, some wetlands up there we want to protect. And those wetlands are getting water, are getting recharge that's locally up here. These might be kind of high elevation wetlands. And so to protect those wetlands, we need to understand not only the area to protect down here with the high recharge area, but we need to protect the upper, the upland recharge areas too. And so wetlands can be either discharge or recharge areas depending on where they, f they fall in the landscape. Uh, so let's look again at our wetland. So let's, we take our wetland here and we blow it up. Um, where does the water come from, the groundwater component of this wetland? Where, where is this, water, this wetland getting its water? Well, it's getting rainwater and it's getting some runoff, but it's also getting groundwater from sort of some sort of a zone that's hydraulically upgradient that we would call the capture zone or the contributing area for that wetland. Uh, and so uh, that means that this is the area of the landscape, which is usually, whoops, let me go back here, um, usually in a, in a map view kind of a uh, oval shaped zone where water, groundwater is coming from a, a recharge or rainfall is landing on the, on, the, on the soil, on the ground, becoming uh, groundwater, and then that groundwater flow system is, is discharging to that wetland. So this is the area where, that's of, where groundwater is actually feeding that wetland. And that's one of the things we do as hydrogeologists is try to figure out where those areas are. So many of you are probably familiar um, with the, uh, the springs over in, uh, in uh, Middleton, uh, Pheasant Branch Springs. So this is Pheasant Branch, uh, one branch of Pheasant Branch Creek. This is looking sort of south, and Lake Mendota would be off here. If you ever go out to the Pheasant Branch uh, Conservancy, there's a wonderful big spring one of the biggest springs in Dane County, by the way, that's right here, that's the start of this, of, of this uh, creek. Um, and it's nice that it's protected in this, in this conservancy. Uh, my colleague Randy Hunt at the USGS a few years ago did some computer simulations looking at the capture area or the contributing area, contributing area of groundwater for that spring. And so if you keep that spring in mind and look at this map, um, he figured out that the groundwater coming out of that spring and feeding this wetland around it comes from a mile or so away in this, in this oblong area. So that's the contributing area for that spring. And the, the reason it's important to know that is that, you know, some of this is an agricultural area. There are highways here. There are potential contamination sources. There are potential land use changes that, that if they occur up here, can affect that wetland. And so this is why we try to understand these things. And, and, but this is also a good example of a, of a capture area or a contributing area for a particular wetland. So when we think about groundwater and wetlands, what are the questions we want to answer? How much groundwater is coming into a wetland, the water budget of the wetland? How fast is that groundwater coming in? And that has to do with hydraulic gradients, hydraulic conductivity, which is the the ability of that, of that rock and soil to, to transfer water, and, and its porosity, which I talked about. How far away does it come from? That has to do with the groundwater flow path. 
how dynamic is the system? How much does it change seasonally or with time or, th or, or with climate change um, or even daily in some cases? What are the characteristics, the chemical characteristics of the water? Uh, that here we think about water quality, mixing of different waters from different places, even uh, contamination uh, sources on the surface. And what's finally, what's the conceptual model of the system? So what is a conceptual model? Conceptual model is a pictorial representation of the groundwater flow system that's most basically a picture. We do a lot of modeling in science, and people often think of models as something we do with computers, and, and we often do. But before we start, it's the best practice is to, is to make a cartoon or a picture or a small diagram of, of really what you're, what you're talking about. And that's what we call a conceptual model. What are the sources and sinks and uh, boundary conditions on a model, uh, just what's the concept of, of, your, of your, your, your wetland here? And so for wetlands, there are at least four conceptual models. I'm going to talk about these and show you examples of them. And, and these, these diagrams are a little small to see, so I'm just going to move ahead and you'll see these again. Um, but, but they all have to do with different uh, uh, landscape settings in which wetlands occur. So let's start in Wisconsin and go to some places here. I don't know how many of you have been to the Mink River, the Mink River Estuary up at the tip of Door County, really lovely, lovely place to go. Uh, but there are springs there, and, there, and the, the springs there can be characterized by a conceptual model like this, which is a, what we would call a complex flow field model. Now, just I'll simplify this for you. There, you see two kinds of lines on here. You see light, or you know, kind of narrow, dark lines, those are lines of equal hydraulic head or hydraulic pressure. And then you see these thicker blue lines with little arrows on them, those are lines of groundwater flow. And so groundwater is going to move from higher to lower hydraulic head, and it's going to move generally sort of perpendicular to these equal potential lines or these lines of hydraulic head. And so when you see, you see a, this is called a flow net, and one of the things hydrogeologists try to do is to delineate what these things look like and then try to understand how, how the groundwater flow lines go. So when you see here, when you see groundwater coming to the surface, this is an area where we'd expect wetlands to occur. If you, see, if you see the flow lines going downward, you think, no, they're not going to occur there because that's a place where more recharge is happening. So if we look at the Mink River, um, it, why are we interested in it? Well, it's a really cool place. It's, it's a, it's a natural area, very pristine freshwater estuary going into Lake Michigan, um, and it's 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 really a fairly un un um, sullied place. It's also the home of the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly, which is a, an endangered species that we we were asked to look at. And one reason we got involved up there is is the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly takes it, it has to um, reproduce in in small carbonate springs and in, in, in this wetland and they wanted the, the Nature Conservancy and others wanted to know where the water was coming from for these springs. So we did some studies up there at these, at these sites in Door County to try to understand where the water was coming from for this, this Heinz Emerald Dragonfly habitat. Interesting enough when the, the, the uh, immature Heinz Emerald Dragonfly is just this little beetle thing here that doesn't look very attractive but uh, that's what the people are, are worried about saving. Um, so the conceptual model, though, is that is that we have this carbonate aquifer, fractured rock. Uh, we have a flow system that's where we have the water table that's indicated by this dashed line, and it's it's sloping down toward the wetland and toward Lake Michigan here. We have recharge that's occurring somewhere up to the left here, and then these groundwater flow pairs are going down, and they're coming back up to the wetland where there are, there, there's general seepage in the wetland, and there are also springs. And this wetland needs, this, the Heinz Admiral Dragonfly needs carbonate groundwater, and so this is a carbonate rock, and so water that's going through there is rich in carbonate minerals, and so that's good habitat for reproduction. And so when we looked at that, here's, here's an air photo of, of the Mink River estuary. This, this is the uh, Green Bay up here, uh, Lake Michigan out here, and then this is the Mink River right here, and, and the, the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly habitat and the springs are right in here. Uh, if we zoom in, look at a different photo, you can see um, 
the uh, spring uh, channels here, and these are these are springs, and this is all a huge wetland complex, all all being really sustained by groundwater. It's interesting though, there are some little point discharges that cause these little springs to come out. The other interesting thing is this, this photo was taken a few years ago when Lake Michigan was low. If we took a picture like this now, it would look a lot different because the lake is higher and most of this is underwater right now because Lake Michigan has come up. I also just like to show this because it's so cool. This is, this is, this is LIDAR imagery of the same place. Uh, uh, really high-tech high uh, topography measured, uh, measured with uh, lasers and you can really see the glacial topography and the, uh, the, the uh, way the landscape has gotten sculpted as the glaciers went over here. But this is the kind of information we use now in our mapping. But anyway, we're the, the, the springs and wetlands we're interested in here are right in here. What we did, we built a computer model based on our conceptual model and so this is, a, this is obviously an aerial view. The blue lines here are lines of equal hydraulic head, or think of it as a map of the, where the water table is. And then we can do these flow lines that are perpendicular to those, and that outlines the capture area for this, the, the springs and wetlands here. So this would be the area uh, of where groundwater comes from that actually ends up here. And we, we, can, we call that the contributing area for these wetlands. And so the, the hashed area or the actual uh, habitat for the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly and the outlined area is the, is the region where the water is actually coming from, the groundwater that's sustaining these springs and this wetland here. So that's, that's, that's one type of wetland and that's the kind of thing that we study when we're trying to, we're trying to understand the groundwater, where the groundwater is coming from. And when we do this, we, we can then do, we can figure out the water budget, how much groundwater is actually coming in, what percentage of the overall wetland water budget that is, and so forth. Let's move a little farther down Door County. We were up here, and let's move down to Peninsula State Park and the Niagara Escarpment, which is this big uh, dolomite cliff here. We can look at a different setting for springs here, S springs that occur along a break and slope. And so if you think of that escarpment, here's that done in a conceptual model. We have the land surface, a big escarpment down to the lake, and we have a water table in there that, that intersects the land surface right at this nick point or, or this break and slope. And so we would expect springs and wetlands to occur at a place like this along this break and slope. And if you go to Door County uh, along the, the, the uh, Green Bay shoreline, that's exactly what you see. Here's a conceptual uh, pictorial uh, um, a diagram of, the, of, the, of that area done by my friends Dan Collins, Nancy Alton, who are landscape architects, just to show you some of the features of Door County, but the important thing for the talk tonight is that there are, there are springs and seeps and wetlands, perennial wetlands, right along the base of this escarpment, and that's what we see here. And so again, the reason that the springs are here is that the water table is sloping downward, hitting in the lake, but it's very near the the surface of the land right at this, at this nick point right here, and that's why we see these perennial wetlands in this place. And again, we can look at the contributing area for that. This is a map view of, of the same area. Um, this is called the, the Bayshore Blufflands Reserve. It's, it's, along, it's along the, uh, the Green Bay side of Door County, and we again did, did some computer modeling to figure out the contributing area for the springs and wetlands along, right along the shoreline, and we, and again, the groundwater is coming from even a couple of miles away to discharge there, so we can understand where the groundwater came from there. Now let's look at a different sort of spring, and we'll move down here to um, Walworth County in the village of Eagle in the Kettle Moraine area. And the, so here we're looking at a different geologic and hydrogeologic setting, and I showed you this picture before where we have a, a stream or a river environment with contiguous wetlands along its shore and groundwater coming in from the sides. And this is the kind of environment you get along the McQuanago River watershed, which is a really high quality wetland rich watershed there. Um, I wanted to point out the importance of, of of riverine uh, environments and groundwater is that there's a lot of geochemistry and geochemical 
biogeochemical bio changes that go on right under a stream, right under a wetland in a zone called the hyperreic zone where there's a lot of, this, this is only a few, maybe a few centimeters or a few inches thick sometimes, but um, uh, it's a zone where there's a lot of bio, uh, biological activity, geochemical activity, and you get a lot of chemical transformations that are occurring that can change water quality right under the stream or the wetland here. So here again you see a stream and you see groundwater converging to, to uh, 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 put water into that stream and into that wetland. If we go to the village of Eagle and the McGuanago River, uh, we, here's the little village of, uh, village of Eagle is up here. And the McGuanago River, it goes through here and it goes through, through some really high quality places that you've probably heard of like Lulu Lake, Eagle Spring Lake, and there's a, there's a state, couple of state natural areas here, a really pristine environment. The reason we got involved with this study was that the village of Eagle had two new groundwater wells here that were, serve, that were drilled to serve, to serve the uh, village. And they were, this is about a mile, they're about a mile south of the village, and they were about a mile or two miles north of the McGuanago River. And the question was, were these wells going to, the pumping of these wells, was this going to impact the, well, the river and the wetlands around it? So we developed a, a groundwater model for this area, and, and as part of that model, again, we, out, we were able to figure out the capture area or the contributing area for the McGuanago River and these wetlands here. And that's what's shown on this diagram, all this, this shaded area and all these dark lines are computer generated flow lines going to the river and the wetlands around it. So this is where the groundwater is coming from. Now you see this, this funny pattern right here. This is the cr contributing area for those two wells. So even though those two wells are, are right here, they are not pulling any water out of the wetland. They are just pulling water from this local area right here. And we concluded that those wells really had very little impact on the overall system. Had they been located in a different place, they might have had a more impact. They were actually located in a, in a fairly good place uh, to prevent any impact to the, to the river there. This also shows you the impact importance of a groundwater divide because there was a groundwater divide here between this watershed and the Scuppernong watershed which is up here and you can see that this water groundwater doesn't cross that divide unless maybe the pumping can change it a little bit but groundwater is coming to the McGuanago from just from this area but you know not from up here so it's a real boundary there. Now let's move to yet a different sort of, of wetland, and we'll go way up to northern Wisconsin to Bayfield County and the upland sand barrens there, and to, to show you a kind of wetland that's, that's precipitated, precipitation dominated, uh, which doesn't mean it's not connected to groundwater at all, but it's, it's, it's a place where there's groundwater, it's recharging groundwater rather than the other way around. So here we see that the, the water table is actually sloping away from the wetland, uh, groundwater is tending to move downward, and the wetland is not getting any, any water from groundwater, but it's just getting water from precipitation. Uh, we see this sort of upland wetland in places like in the Schwamaga Nicolay National Forest, and a good place is the, what are called the sand barrens in Bayfield County, sometimes called the blueberry barrens because they, it's, it's uh, ripe with blueberries certain times of the year. These are old sand dunes, uh, and the, the water, the water table can be uh, a couple of hundred feet down sometimes, but there are there are small wetlands up here that are that are maintained by mostly by rainfall because this is such a sandy environment. There's very little runoff, uh, and that water is then after it sits in the wetland for a while, it's, it gradually uh, uh, soaks in and moves down to recharge the groundwater system below that. So these are important areas for groundwater recharge, and, and the, wet, the wetland function there is pretty important for. Uh, maintaining groundwater recharge in this sandy place. Now sometimes, um, I mentioned things can change with time, and sometimes things, uh, 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 surface water and groundwater can be, become connected or disconnected dis different times of the, of the year or, or, or in different years depending on, on uh, what the weather and the climate are doing. So here's an example of a place where there's a, there may be a stream that was um, uh, flowing with water, and it may have been a place where 
it was somewhere disconnected from the water table here, and there was, but, but water was still coming out of the stream and moving into the water table, and that's why you see a little mound in the water table here. But if that stream dries up in a very dry summer, um, it's gone and the water table becomes completely flat, so uh, the, the, here's a complete disconnection of the groundwater and surface water. Another example of a wetland like that is something that I had the pleasure of, of observing in, in I, when I spent some time in Zimbabwe about 10 years ago. Uh, I worked with some people there on, on uh, wetlands in, the, in, in, the, uh, in one of the, the conservancies they have in Zimbabwe. And in, in, uh, in Zimbabwe, in Africa, they call these wetlands pans. These are the sort of watering holes that the, you know, you think of the animals coming and getting a drink in the, in the, in the dry times and so forth. But in the dry time of year, this, this is the, really the same place. And you can see that this wetland is completely dried up in, in, uh, in their dry season, which is November. And then it's full of water and it's got flowers and plants and it's a pretty nice looking place in February. And we were doing some research there with, um, with uh, South Africans and then some of the scientists from Zimbabwe about trying to understand where the water came from for this wetland. Was this groundwater that was rising up or was this entirely surface water dominated? And so we, we did some uh, coring by hand because this was out in a place where we couldn't get any motorized or, you know, equipment out. So we did a lot of hand augering out there. And what we discovered was that this, this, this pan, this is a cross section, was, was several meters above the regional water table. And in fact, never intersected the water table. So this is a wetland that's completely um, uh, always above the water table, which doesn't mean it doesn't have anything to do with groundwater because when it, when the water soaks in, it gets down and recharges the groundwater table down here. But it's, it's a, there's a lot of, um, of unsaturated zone in between the two. So this was the, this was the profile of the landscape that we developed there based on these core holes that we, that we drilled that went from this pan over to the Save River here. And uh, so that was really interesting work, but a, a, just another kind of wetland to, to see. Now we have a lot of lakes in Wisconsin, and lakes are, are, are sort of similar to wetlands. Of course, they represent outcrops of the water table, and, and we do a lot of conceptual modeling of lakes, too. Lakes can be places where um, they're, they're receiving water, groundwater, from around their, their, around their perimeter or they're seepage lakes, they're losing groundwater everywhere, or they're flow-through lakes where groundwater is flowing in one side and out the other. And, and they're very analogous to wetlands because basically a wetland in a way is just a, a lake that's very shallow and, but has, has sort of the same, the same features. So understanding where, you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to understand how lakes fit into groundwater flow systems because for all the same reasons, understanding the lake water budget. And related to that, of course, are, are springs. And groundwater is sustaining springs. And springs are lo usually located in places, again, where there are wetlands. Wetlands and springs often go together. Uh, we've, in the last few years, we've done a lot of work at the Geological and Natural History Survey mapping and, and compiling records of springs in Wisconsin. Um, there have been over 10,000 springs identified in Wisconsin. There's probably more than that. Those are the ones we have records for. As far as big springs, which, which are uh, uh, over one cubic foot per second, which is a pretty darn big spring, there are fewer of those. There are something of a couple of hundred or, or more of big springs that, that people really would note, although they haven't all been mapped. And we've just finished up a new, new mapping of, of, of the big springs in Wisconsin. But these are all related to where wetlands are as well. Um, to show you how springs are important, I, I love this picture because this, this if you know where, where Donald Park is, out on, uh, near, near Mount Vernon, this is, this is a picture of people from the town, the village of Mount Vernon, out, out around a place called Big Spring in Donald Park, you know, 100 years ago or so, and you can see there's people in a, there's a brass band, there's people in their Sunday best. Shows you that springs were a pretty important place. Here's the whole the whole town having their pictures taken. That spring is still there, and you can go there, and this is what it looks like now. Um, without a brass band, it's a pretty neat place. And if you go there, there's there's boiling boiling sand, meaning the hydraulic gradients are making that making that sand uh, churn and and sort of boil uh, 
down there from the, from the hydraulic gradients coming up. So I, I recommend a, a visit to that place. And just to show you what that's, what that's like, there's an, here's another spring from our statewide spring inventory, some underwater photography just showing how the groundwater coming in is, is uh, causing the sediment there to, to be roiled, roiled up. Um, so springs are pretty neat places, but they're always often related to, uh, to wetlands, of course. Finally, let's finish up with talking about high capacity wells and things that might affect wetlands that, that, that uh, pe people do. Basically, high capacity wells are what we use for water supply. All the water in Madison is coming out of high capacity wells. You've probably heard of high capacity wells being used for irrigation of crops. They're a pretty important feature of our, of our, uh, our landscape and our society now. High capacity wells pull water out of the ground and they do two things uh, that are just inevitable. They lower groundwater levels around the well, and they reduce groundwater flow to nearby surface water features like wetlands. Uh, and so understanding how those things are related is, is important for understanding how to protect, protect wetlands. And the way that works, here's just some, again, some conceptual models or cartoons. If we have a, a groundwater flow system, and you, this, can, this here it's shown as a, as a river, but it could be a wetland or a lake or whatever, we have, again, this recharge area up here we have flow lines that are going down and then they're discharging here. If we put a well here near the stream in this case and we pump that well, the well causes a cone of depression. That's the drawdown of the water table above the well here, making that cone. And that water is getting pumped out and, and because that water is getting pumped out, that water has to come from somewhere. And so it, it, it's, it's produced by, first of all, dewatering part of the aquifer here, but also diminishing the amount of water that's hitting that stream. Water is still coming into the stream. You can see the arrows are still going there, but they're not, they're, there's maybe not as many of them and there's a little less water for the stream because that water is coming out of the well now. And here we've increased the pumping of that well even more, and so now we've actually reversed the flow and we're pulling water out of the stream to feed the well. You don't get something for nothing. If you kind of take water out of the well, it always comes from somewhere and something else it's depleted. So um, you've probably heard of the Little Plover River. We've, it's an area of the state we've done a lot of research on in the last few years. It's in the middle of our potato growing area in Wisconsin where there's a lot of, it's a very important vegetable industry, potatoes and corn and so forth, uh, but it's also very dependent on irrigation. And so there's, there's been uh, some controversy over irrigation wells. So, so we did a, a project there a couple of years ago looking at how irrigation wells in that area were affecting or interacting with the Little Plover River and the wetlands around it. Uh, Little Plover River is, is a, uh, was historically a trout stream. It's now a state fishery area, but it's right in the middle. Uh, it's right in the middle of a, of a number of potato fields. It has a lot of nice, nice looking wetlands associated with it. Um, here's the Little Plover River. It's, it's, it's just a couple of miles south of uh, the village of Plover and then Stevens Point. Uh, here's its watershed, its surface watershed. And here's the river itself. And all these little dots are irrigation wells, high capacity irrigation wells that are used for mostly for potato growing, some for, some for corn and some for uh, beans. And, and the question we had was, was what are these, how are these wells affecting the flow in the Little Plover River? Because there was perception that over time, the flow had been diminished. And, and there were questions about, well, was, was that related to, say, climate change? Was it related to something else? Or was it, how could it be traced to just these wells uh, themselves? And frankly, the records weren't all, always all that clear. So here again, you have, uh, this is results from a model. You have these, these lines. These, these are these groundwater water table contours going from higher to lower. And so we expect groundwater to be flowing, to be flowing perpendicular to those lines. So if we take all the wells away and we do a model without any wells in it, and we look at the contributing area or the capture area for the river and the wetlands around it, it looks like this. This is called the no pumping simulation. And you can see how, let's take a look at the size of that. And so that means that any water, groundwater that gets into this area eventually ends up somewhere in this river. And, and so there's a, there's a balance between how much water is discharged by the river and, how much, how, and the size of this area. 
And then we look at it today with the wells, and you can see it looks a lot different. It's kind of jaggedy looking, and that's because these wells, many of them are intercepting water that, that previously went to the river. And, and, and you can see overall the capture zone is smaller. And so if you overlay the two, you can see that, that it is significantly smaller than it used to be. And that we can, we can trace that directly to the number of wells that are pumping, they are, are, are causing this to be smaller. Because it's smaller, there's less groundwater captured by the stream, or there, there's less water going into the river, and, and so the, we would expect the flow to be less. And we can, and having a model like this, we can then do experiments and see which of these wells we would have to take out or move around to different places to improve or to restore flow in the river and flow to wetlands around it. And, that's, and actually there are some groups that are using the model just for that purpose now. So to finish up today, uh, the, some of the take home messages are that uh, wetlands and groundwater and surface water are all part of the same system. They're, they should be thought of as one single resource managed together. You can't manage one without managing the others. Uh, and you can't affect one with really without affecting the others. All water comes from somewhere. And, and sometimes I, in my career I've, I've I, I know people, people understand this at some point, but they, they think you can pump water out of the ground and it has no effect on anything because it's a limitless supply. It's not a limitless supply. It's, everything's connected, so if you take water out of one place, it always affects something else. And so understanding the water balance is critical for management decisions. Wetlands are connected to local groundwater systems, and they are largely controlled by geologic and topographic settings. And pumping from high-capacity wells near streams and wetlands can reduce stream flow or reduce water levels in wetlands. And, uh, but these impacts, they, they depend on things like the amount of pumping, the distance between the wetland and the well, or the stream and the well, how long the well is on, and a lot of other things. So all those are parameters that we have to think about, but, but, but these are some of the main takeaways for here. I'll stop there and answer any questions you might have. Yes, ma'am. Very, very sandy, yes, indeed. Can, can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, her, her question was, is the area around the Little Clover River very sandy soil? And the answer is yes. It's part of the what we call the central sands or central sand plains. So, yeah, very sandy. Uh, yes, sir. So if the primary reason for those wells is irrigation, doesn't a good percentage of that go back into the drainage area that feeds the river? That's a great question. So his question was... Um, uh, if, if the primary use of the wells is for irrigation, doesn't a lot of the irrigation go back to the groundwater system? And, and that's, that's actually a very astute question because some of it does, but not all of it. If, you know, the, 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 plants, the, the plants are evapotranspiring. And we, in our study, that was, that was a pretty, a pretty um, uh, important question. And we've, we concluded after a lot of, a lot of work that it's something like 20% of the water gets recharged, and we, we count that as what we call return flow, uh, and the rest of it is, is used by plants. And obviously the growers don't want to, you know, they, it costs them money to irrigate, so they don't want to use more water than they have to. So it's, they, they, they want as, basically they would want as little return flow as they, as they can because they want their, their irrigation to be very efficient. But, but that's, a, that's an important point that uh, some people don't, don't understand. Can I repeat that as 80% does not get recharged? Yes. 20% yep. does, 80% does Yes, yeah, and it, you know, it, depends, it depends, Tom, on the crop and the time of year and a lot of other things, but 80% is a pretty good number, I think. Uh, let's see. Go ahead, sir. I have two questions. One, what's the explanation for Lake Michigan uh, water level rising? And the second question is about water and mining in Wisconsin. Water and fracking in Wisconsin. Maybe you give us a comment about that. Well, the widest, Lake Michigan is rising because um, uh, mainly uh, changes in weather in the last few years. We've had, we've, we've had wetter and longer 
as, as, as we are this year, longer, wetter winters recently. I think that's the main reason it's rising now. Um, as far as uh, mining and fracking, what, what do you have a specific question about that? Or, uh, well, as far as water in Wisconsin, whether it's groundwater or any, as we said, it's all part of the system. Right. Do you well, have any observations or comments about the effect of mining? Sure. Well, it depends on. Okay. So his question is about the effects of, of mining, and he's particularly mentioned of, of fracking and uh, frac sand uh, on water resources. Uh, first thing, we don't do any fracking in Wisconsin. We do frac sand mining. Um, now, frac sand mining, uh, which is mainly up in the north west Wisconsin around Eau Claire, Chippewa Falls, and so forth, is the main center of that. They do use quite a bit of water for processing uh, the sand, washing it, and so forth. A lot of that is recycled. Um, and so the, the, and we've done some studies on this, and the amount of water used for that is not, um, it doesn't seem to be having a big impact. Uh, you know, it's, they don't use more, a lot more than a, than a community would use or something. The longer term, there are concerns with, with groundwater quality not so much from the processing, but from the long-term reclamation of those sites, because they've, to, to uh, do the mining, they remove the soil, they, uh, and they remove different rock formations that aren't used for sand, and later on when they reclaim, they, they put those back. In the interim, that material has been sitting at the surface, it's been oxidized, it's been stirred up and, and um, uh, Disturb, which can release different minerals. Some of those, some of those uh, materials can have have trace metals in them that can get into water. That's a fairly young industry, so that we probably not enough time has gone by to understand all the processes that could happen. But we do have some ongoing studies there. Um, if you're talking about other types of mining, like hard rock mining, uh, there are water issues associated with those. Of both water quality and water quantity, depending on the mine you want to have, it's it's a uh, important analysis that needs to be made anytime we have a mining project. Uh, yes, sir. I have a couple of questions too, <coughs> with regard to um, that depletion of those aquifers. Um, in other parts of the country, say the plain states or a state like Nebraska, where they have been depleting aquifers for some time. The interests there are like agricultural interests. How do the how where does that conflict get resolved? Whether it's Wisconsin or somewhere else, where do those is that important? Well, it, of course, it depends where you it depends on the state. I, I I'm sure, you know, in some um, well, Kansas, for example, Kansas is a place where uh, now they are compared to Wisconsin, they're very arid, particularly western Kansas. There are places there where many, many, many streams have, have basically dro gone dry due to irrigation. They have different laws and property rights about irrigation than we do here. But in Kansas, the state, I, th I think it's the state, have started buying back some of the irrigation rights. Uh, in other words, paying money to farmers not to irrigate, and then the, so the streams can come back. Now in Wisconsin, we haven't. We haven't done that, as you're probably aware. There's, there was a lot of debate in our legislature last year about how to regulate high-capacity wells. Um, and the, right now, the, the way the law is is that, is that you pretty much, pretty much any well that, um, with some exceptions, almost any, any high-capacity well for irrigation is, going, is getting a permit right now. Uh, with, with, unless it, unless it, there are certain restrictions, like if it's next to a trout stream or 1,200 feet from a um, from a lake or something like that, but uh, it's we we uh, our, our 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 laws were, in my opinion, kind of loosened up for for approving wells last year. I my as a hydrogeologist, I would say my my philosophy is that I think we have enough science to do this correctly. You know, we we understand enough about where wells should be and where they shouldn't be to give people guidance. Uh, but it's you know it's a it's a um, you know, it's a, it's not a simple issue because the the farmers, you know, uh, 
have an, have an industry and a livelihood and they need water to have assurance on their crops, so that's, that's an important consideration too. That, that touches a little bit on my second question. I, um, lately I've become aware that, um, you know, there are, there are farms where um, the farmers um, took what we would regard as um, wetlands or bogs or marshes many years ago and installed drainage ditches or drainage tile or whatever and, and have been cropping those farms for quite some time. And we now have programs where we advance money to those farmers in order to reclaim some of that land so that it returns to marsh and there's some straight ponds or restoration of wildlife or <coughs> that type of thing going on there to reclaim that. But at the same time, we have some other land that's never been farmed that verges on marsh status where those people are interested in finding buyers doing something with it, trying to make some money off it, and we don't route any money to that. And yeah. it seems like it seems like their money would be better spent to protect the land that's not yet been converted than to reclaim this land that's been tiled and drained in. Well. Yeah, that's, you're probably right. I'm not, <laughs> uh, you know, it all depends how, you know, people have to have to vote and get involved. And, you know, this, decisions are like that are made politically and politically means who votes and what people want to do. So that's, that's as far as I can go with that one. Got, in the back, you've had your hand up for a while. Hey, thank you. Um, there's been some talk, uh, uh, we have different categories of wetlands mm -hmm. that are regulated, they have, uh, isolated wetlands, and yeah. then we have ones that are hydraulically connected. I think the Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government regulates those that are considered hydraulically connected, and then the state uh, regulates these ones, these isolated ones, and there was some talk about maybe loosening up the restrictions on those. Has anybody ever really looked at what we're talking about there and what kind of impact that could have? Just what kind of wetlands are an isolated wetland? What kind are are these uh, well, oh sure yeah those are, people have looked at that I mean it's and, and they argue about what kind of, of, of uh, impact that could have I mean the even you know isolated wetlands are wetlands that don't have surface water connections between them but they still are you know hydrologists know that those are pretty can be pretty important for things like flood control you know just you know when it we have a big rainstorm where does that water sit it sits in it can sit in isolated wetlands and that prevents us from having to build more flood control structures and having, you know, having huge erosion and so forth. So, so those, those, there's environmental value to having, having those. Now, others would argue there's a cost of not using that land for something else. So it's, again, it's a trade-off. You know, there have been a lot of analyses. I mean, I think people would, I don't have the figures here, but, you know, people know how many acres of the different kinds of wetlands there are. Yeah, I was just kind of curious if they, like in the categories that you had, are they, are they considered more in the upland kind of areas? Or uh, areas? The isolated wetlands are probably more, more in, the, in the lowland or the, that, that first category I showed of the, of the more complex groundwater flow path type. Uh, uh, yes, sir. How do you come up with the pressure gradient lines in your maps? Are those directly measured? And if so, how or are they from ground topography other things. Okay, question was how do we how do we get the gradient lines on our maps? Well that's um, that's a great question because we in the field it, it's a little both. We put in wells and pisometers as in, in doing field work and with a, you know well you, I think you probably understand what a well is. A pisometer is just a well that's got a very short screen on the end, meaning it may be only a few inches long. And basically that's measuring the pressure at whatever depth we put that in. And by putting those at different depths, we can measure the different pressure in the, the hydraulic pressure in the ground at different depths. And we find that it, it, it's, you know, it changes with depth. That, and that's why you, we can measure an upward or a downward gradient. And we can do the same thing laterally, and we can measure how the water table is sloping laterally. Now, of course, we can't, we can't put hundreds and hundreds of wells in. We can't do that everywhere. So usually what we do is we we measure a few places, and then we do a, some sort of a model to, tr to try to integrate that and, and come up with a model that fits our field data but gives us some extrapolation to other places. 
Yes, sir. Given the situation of Key 1 in County, uh, with the Capos and the, and the contaminated wells, what, what's your idea of a solution for the, the homeowner and the well and the Capo conflict in ah. Key 1 County? Well, that's a that's that's a fraught question, sir. Uh, um, you know, to, to be honest, I think there's too just too many darn cows up there for the for the carrying capacity of that landscape, which is a you know the Kiwani County parts of the county have very thin soil, and so the, and and if 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 we're trying to use the natural soil environment as a manure disposal. Uh, mechanism, uh, I think we're overloading the land. That's part of the problem there. Um, so the, the, the people I know that are working there would probably say we there's probably just too many cattle up there. Now, um, the um, well, I think that's that's kind of the bottom line. More, you know, we've been doing at the survey. We've been doing things like. Bed, depth of bedrock maps to try to show people where better places to dispose of manure are, places to avoid, so there can be better planning on that, that sort of thing. But bottom line, that's there. There may be places that we can't, we just don't have the carrying capacity for that many cattle as, as we're seeing there now. Yes, sir. Can you give us an idea as to what the the cost of both dollars and time are involved? Sure. Well, it, the the little plover was uh, um, it was something like three hundred thousand dollars for three years, and that involved quite a few people. So um, that's that's uh, you know we're, we're it's in the hundred hundred thousand dollar more or less range for a for a a good scientific study of a of a large area. You know, so much of that is. Depends on the scope and the time and sure. what you want to get out of it. That was a pretty sophisticated study, so probably more expensive than many, but less expensive than others sometimes. And it also took three, about three years. Yeah, so yeah. That would be typical of a, a three-year study would be typical of, uh, you know, say somebody needed to study, for example, uh, line So, yes, yeah, if, if, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. The question is how much does a study cost and how long does it take? You know, often in, in, in hydrologic studies, one, t one thing we factor in is, is, is we want to get some seasonal data. So you, you don't want to just do a summer, you want to get through a couple of seasons to see how things are changing with time. So that can stretch a study out just from logistically that point. Um, but yeah, a couple of years is a reasonable, it's what most of our studies take us. Um, and again, it depends on how many people you can throw at it, how much money you have, and the more money and the more people, you can maybe do it faster. But, we are often limited by wanting to get seasonal data and, and getting through a, you know, a, a, a year or two just to see how things are changing. Because you know you could get one year that's a, a big drought and it's not typical of, a, of another year. Sure. So you want, you want to try to get sort of an average year. I think, I think in terms of, to, to me, in terms of the benefit to the society or the world, it's fairly inexpensive. When you consider how much people spend on a well, or on a home, and what's your home worth if it doesn't have water, uh, which is basically nothing? Uh, you know, it's 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 not it's it's not a huge investment. Yes, ma'am. When you consider a, a project um, that's going to happen in Southeast Western Wisconsin, like Foxconn, when do people like you get called in? Um, well, I haven't been called in at all in <laughs> Foxconn yet, so. I don't know when. <laughs> well, um, I, I, we were surprised. We haven't we haven't heard a thing from Foxconn. Now I know that others have. I mean, the uh, Southwest or Southeast Regional Planning Commission has gotten involved, and and so and, and, and they have information that we have prepared for them in years past. So somebody is is doing work, but um, we we're part of UW Extension. Um, we. We don't insert ourselves in projects, but we respond when people call us. So, um, I, when, how, when do they call us? It's not up to me. 
<laughs> it's up to us. Well, it's up to it's up to it's up to whoever is. Yeah, it's up to local people. It's up to whoever the decision makers are. You know, we do a lot of work with DNR, and and um, uh, sometimes DNR calls us in. Sometimes they don't. Uh, but again, we don't we don't insert ourselves in projects. We're there to help people when they ask us to help them. Um, back here. Um, I have a question in regards to the modeling. Um, without, I assume that the models would be highly dependent on the topography underneath the ground, but that's very hard to find, right? I, I don't know ge geology that much, but um, is there a way to find it? And if there is, um, how do you factor yeah, great question. So his question was about when we make models, we have to know a lot about the subsurface, and that's that's what we that's what geologists do. We we do. You're, you're right. It's not it's not easy. We sometimes we drill. We do a lot of rock drilling with. Uh, we do rock coring, and that gives us information about the the rocks. But we also do uh, geophysical surveys, and geophysics means that we we measure some kind of physical properties that might be. Uh, uh, might be gravity. It might be electrical. We, you know, we, it might be electrical signals. It might be seismic, where we put a sound wave in the ground, and and we can get. Uh, or it might be radar. We have a subsurface radar unit, so we we have indirect ways of collecting information about the subsurface. So, for example, you mentioned underground topography. I would call that. Often we want to know, uh, say the the yeah the topography of a of a buried rock surface, the bedrock surface, for example. Uh, seismic surveys are a very good way to do that, where we bounce sound waves off off that surface and back up, and we interpret what that surface must look like. So there are, there are quite a few tools that, and the and there, are, a lot of them were developed by the petroleum industry over the years, and now they're now they're being used for more kind of environmental work like like we do. Tom, what's the legal status of groundwater in Wisconsin? Who owns it? pump it out of the land underneath your feet, but uh, it flows. Is that well established in law? Is it at play? Um, I think it's sort of in play right now, <laughs> frankly. I mean, it's, it's, it's thought of as a common, uh, you know, a, a, a common good, you, but, it, but everyone has a right to use, if you own property, you have a right to the water under your property. But do you own the water? I don't think you own the water. But that's, but, but that's not, um, you know, if you, if, you start, if you start playing that out, um, everybody's got a right to some water, but because the water's moving around, if I start affecting my neighbor, uh, so they, have a right to it. they have a right to it as well. It's a common, is it not in common? It's a common, yeah, it's, 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 well, it depends what, to, I'm not a lawyer, so. I, I'll be careful not not go too far down so that road. Do you have a person that, that's like in the law school here or somebody <coughs> in Wisconsin who's a, a lawyer who specializes in law? Uh, well, there are. I, yeah. Here on campus? I don't know who else. I mean, there. I know water. I know people in private practice. I, on campus, I, I'm not sure. Uh, there probably is somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there used to be Professor McDonald used to be that have that specialty, but I he's retired. He uh, gone. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's an opportunity for a faculty position here as a research position given on you know, how important yeah. it is in Wisconsin and how controversial. Well, yeah, I mean, and there are, there are definitely people working on that. I just, it's not, I'm not one of them. So, anything else? Uh, let's see, the woman up here. You pointed out uh, the springs at Pheasant Ranch mm -hmm. and the, the area in the, I guess, the catchment. Place. Right. Um, are there ongoing, is there ongoing monitoring of, uh, the quali of what might be going into that? Uh, I'm not aware that anything's going on at Pheasant Branch right now. For a while there was some monitoring, but I'm not, I, I don't think anybody is monitoring that at, at present. I could be wrong. Uh, you know, there have been a number of 
there have been some a couple of student projects and research projects that went on, but I don't, I'm not aware of any now, but I could be wrong because it's, it's such a neat place to study that there may well be somebody doing something there. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have any thoughts on the back 40 mine big holes on the uh, Peninsula? Well, yeah, the, yeah, I know where that is. Um, well, the question, the question is, well, what about the, the back 40 mine, which that's up right on the, it's in Michigan, it's in the UP, it's right on the border. Um, it, it, with any mine like that, there's, there's, there's certainly risk, uh, but it's also, but also mines are, a, uh, just like I said, you don't get something for nothing. If we want, we want to have technology and cars and everything, there has to be mines somewhere. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, from what I know of that, it's being done, the, the science is being done well. But I don't, I have to say, I don't, I, I haven't, we're, we're not involved in the permitting of that, you know, that's a Michigan thing. So we're not, we're not involved in reviewing it or anything like that. Um, there's always, whenever there's a mine, there's, there's certainly risks as there are with any industrial operation of, of spills and so forth. But I, as far as I know, it's, you know, it's kind of a state of the art uh, uh, proposal. That's, that's pretty much what I know about that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Does your, does your organization study pathogens in the water? Uh, uh, yeah, in fact, I gave a talk in here about that a few years ago. Uh, we work on, on viruses in groundwater, uh, and, and some of my colleagues are now working on other things in, uh, in, in groundwater, so, so yes. Uh, in fact, it's been interesting. My colleague named Mark, Mark Borkhart has been working in Kiwani County looking at trying to answer the question about um, are the pathogens in, say, Kiwani County coming from cattle or are they coming from human septic waste? And he's concluded they come from both. <laughs> so, you know, it's, which isn't too big a surprise, but it, it's, um, it, it eliminates some of the finger pointing. So, you know, rather than everybody blaming other people, it's people are starting to realize that it's everybody's problem. Uh, and and the, that's actually an exciting new field because now we can do uh, uh, with, with different, not necessarily pathogens, but some, with some pathogens, we can do environmental source tracking to determine, you know, microbial source tracking to determine where some of these, some of these pathogens came from, some kind of, what kind of animal or even what kind of, you know, uh, which, which home or whatever, because there are, there are laboratory techniques that are much better at all than they were a few years ago. They're giving us better information. Yes, ma'am. Tom may have been referring to the, what's known as the public trust doctrine mm -hmm. in the state of Wisconsin, and there is a suit in Door County right now on that, and while it was won at one level, it's being appealed again in spite of the DNR ruling on that. <coughs> but related to Door County, how is it that within the structure there, because you've studied it, a well will test with good water quality one year, and the next year not, and then keep flipping back and forth? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So he, she asked about Door County, like how can a well go be good and bad and back and forth? And, and that's exactly what we found. We, we studied, this was you know, 20 years ago or so, we, we found that over a, we, looked, we measured over 100 wells periodically, found that any one of the wells was, had bacteria about 30% of the time. And 30% of the wells had bacteria at any one time, but it wasn't always the same wells. Why do they change? Why do they go back and forth? It's because of that fractured rock, because the flow paths are so rapid that you can, you know, you can have a spill of something that gets to the well rapidly, and then after it rains again, that's washed away. The good news is that because things travel fast, you can clean up that aquifer pretty rapidly. The bad news is that things happen rapidly and that a, a spill in the surface can get your well in you know, in hours, uh, minutes maybe sometimes. It's, so it's, it's a very, very vulnerable well. And that's the same problem in Kiwani County, that there's very vulnerable landscapes there. Yes? I have one question uh, concerned with the toxicity. Of, uh, is it when it's, when you get that uh, uh, bacteriological count and it's rising, 
when you say that uh, you know the flow washes it off. Is it just a dilution and it's just moving around to the rest of them and that's why they start accepting these higher rates of toxicity? Or is it actually getting cleaned up somewhere? Well, both, it could either, I mean, there is biodegradation, there's degradation and biodegradation. So, you know, there are a lot of things that can happen. So dilution is one thing. You might, and then, then there's this physical breakdown of, of whatever it is that can render it n not, not pathogenic. Uh, and then there's sorption or, uh, you know, the material may be getting stuck somewhere too and not be, and not be mobilized. So all, you have a number of different processes that can go on. Or it can just be f flow away and discharge to the spring or wherever and, and, and it's out of the system. So you have a, there's a variety of, of things that can happen to a, to a pathogen or any contaminant in groundwater. But do you notice any rise in a general sense across? Uh, oh, being through generally through time. Yeah, over time, you know, do something like uh, that. Well, I think it's it's most it's more episodic. I mean, we we often see. You know, I would say. Um, you know, something something like like bac bacteria levels, are so. Um, um, they're so episodic that it, you know nobody is nobody's going through and giving you one number for year after year, but you might look at a number of hits, for example, number of, 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 of positives. Is that going up? Um, maybe, I'm not sure, but you know, what we often see is that in times of the year like, like now, this the spring, when the snow melts, that's when we get a lot of hits. Later in the summer when it's dry, we haven't gotten the rain, you don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of uh, contaminants because there's not a lot of recharge going on. It's usually, at least in Door County where I've worked a lot, it's very episodic and, it, and you, get, you get contaminated wells after big rainstorms or after snow melt, something like that. Particularly in the spring, particularly if people have spread manure in the winter, it's sitting on the ground and we get a big snow melt, a lot of recharge, that's when people get brown water out of their wells, wells that smell like cow manure, which you, they do sometimes. So. Um, that's that's when you get a problem. As for long-term trends, there may be one, but it's it's probably it's pretty hard to document. I think. Any other yes, sir. Uh, aquifers. Um, would you say everywhere in Wisconsin there's an aquifer? If you drill deep enough, is the whole state flowing that water? Uh, well, a good question. Do we have an aquifer everywhere? Um, Wisconsin has has great aquifers, but not everywhere. So, and, and, uh, the, the deeper you go, probably the worse they go. Because our, our um, say here in Madison, we have, you know, at the surface we may have clay and soil, but if you drill down, you'll hit sandstone. You'll hit a thousand feet of pretty good sandstone. That's a great aquifer. Below that, you're running into granite, and that's not a good aquifer. And the deeper you go, you're just going to get more granite or, or crystalline rock. And, it, and, and it's, it's not very water-bearing at all. Uh, much of Wisconsin is like that, uh, except if you go up to northern Wisconsin, say Marathon County or Clark County, uh, where you have clayey glacial material, so you don't have much aquifer and the sand, you know, there's not much sand and gravel, and right under that you have crystalline rock. So there are places up there, say around Marshfield, where it's pretty tough it can be pretty tough to get a good well. Um, but, but that's, most, most parts of the state, it's, it's hard to miss. You know, you can drill a well almost anywhere and get water, but not, not in a place like Ron Marshfield. Deep aquifer and a shallow aquifer, is that typical? Often there are, are yes, that's, that's fairly typical. It depends, again, where you go. If you, um, for instance, if you over on Milwaukee, we have uh, uh, Silurian, or the, the, the rocks that are at the surface in Door County, the dolomite or limestone, that's, that's near the surface, say near Milwaukee. If you drill through that, you, get into, you go through a shale layer, then you get into the same sandstone that's under us here, except it's much deeper over there because it's, it's, those formations are dipping off to the, to the east. Um, so. Um, it, it's not uncommon to have, have a couple of different aquifers <coughs> stacked. We don't have, our, but 
generally our hydrogeology is, is simple compared to many other states. Here we, we have just a couple of aquifer layers. Other states may have four or five or six or seven, depending on where you go. You know, Illinois has, uh, particularly southern Illinois, their, their, their sandstone goes down 20,000 feet. Ours only goes down here 1,000 feet. So because they're in, the, they're in a, a, big, a big structural basin, uh, uh, there. Uh, now that water down there is not very good. It's pretty salty and uh, uh, not probably very good to drink, but, but uh, it's much thicker. Any other questions? Boy, thanks for all the questions. What an what a interesting audience. <laughs>